Let's see, like for instance, uh, I beg Apache HTTP client. It is very common or is very used across multiple plugins. So if, I, if the plugin that I'm using, it depends on that uh, particular library. It, it, I can upgrade it just for my plugin or it have uh, an impact on remaining plugins, how? That, that's how a very work. good question. So I think what you're asking is, what is the downstream impact if my plugin declares that it needs a newer version of one of its dependencies? Is that a fair way to say what you're asking? Yeah, okay, so so let's let's take the specific example of the Git plugin if it says it needs, it will require at least a certain version of promoted builds, then what that means is when users install the new version of the Git plugin, if they don't have at least that minimum version of promoted builds, they will have to upgrade to it and Jenkins will offer the upgrade automatically um, to get that new version. So if I mandate a, a, a newer version of dependency, then the, when someone installs my new release with that mandatory newer version, they must have at least that version installed. It, it, they can have a newer version than that, but they must have at least that version. Did, did that help? Yep. Okay, so, so one of the, one of, it, it, for me, that highlights one of the, the real benefits of the Bill of Materials. Before I implemented Bill of Materials, in the, in the Git plugin, for instance, I was terrified to update dependency version numbers because I worried that I was going to break someone. I worried that I was going to force them to upgrade to a newer version of a plugin. And I, I spent a, an unjustified amount of time worrying, oh, do I dare increase the dependency version number of of, let's see, my examples were of the multi, the matrix, Pro matrix um, plugin. Will I break someone because they depend on a very old version? Well, with my transition to the bill of materials, the decision is no longer in my hands. It's whatever's in the bill of materials. And what's happened is that's promoted the, the decision amongst many, many plugin developers that they will all bias towards depending on recent versions of plugins. So all of a sudden, the entire Jenkins community is getting the benefit of more frequent upgrades to plugins and getting more people on largely the same versions because of this bill of materials change. So, so for me, the bill of materials has been not just helpful to me as a developer, it's been helpful to the users because they're tending to get more of them on similar version numbers. So did, did that did that address the question, Marcel? Yeah, perfect. Super, thank you. thank you. Other other questions. I maybe can share my experience. <laughs> Just a, just a short, uh, um, I have, uh, I, yesterday I have uh, reverted my uh, Jenkins installation to the previous LTS version <laughs> and uh, about 20 plugins didn't match the version of the previous LTS release. <laughs> so it wasn't possible to, to step back one LTS release. Maybe, it's it's uh, will help someone. <laughs> well, and and that's in the future, a, were you going from two eighty nine back to two seventy seven or from yes. two seventy seven? Okay, so and and that that has been a that has certainly been a big transition. Now, do you track your do you track or have you attempted to track your configuration with configuration as code? No, it's uh, it's painful. I I really like to use configuration as code. But we deployed uh, Jenkins uh, the um, old way, not not in a container, but uh, installing in the file system as a WAR file, mm -hmm. and uh, all the dependencies lay in the file system in Jenkins home, and there is no way to, uh, you know, just uh, 
to tell, okay, with this new version come this version of plugin because they are already there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and and uh, it is an impossible to apply configuration as code in such manner. Uh, in, in container world, it, it is, I think it is easier because you start a new container. There's such a great uh, feature that you can install all needed plugins for this particular Jenkins version uh, inside this container and uh, run run it, uh, but um, not if you install the old way, the <laughs> file system way. <laughs> and uh, this, is, uh, um, this is a problem right now for us. <laughs> so so I, was, I was living in exactly that kind of a world and, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. I installed from a war file. I was using, in my case, the, the Debian package, right? So I installed the Debian package onto, onto my Debian or my Ubuntu, but I, I was able to find a path that let me eventually move towards that. And I wonder if it might be worth your considering one of the things that, okay, I don't wanna disturb my production instance, right? It, it, we're gonna continue managing exactly. But what I found was that if I took a, a copy of that instance and attempted to build myself a preview of it or a prototype of it. In, in my case, I built it in a Docker image. Uh, so I, I ended up taking with rsync a copy of the plugins directory and the config.xml files for the jobs and various other config files. And then one little file at a time, one piece at a time, my, my separate copy got a little bit of configuration as code in one segment and a little bit of configuration as code in another. And I spent months of slow progress getting there, but those months of progress ultimately ended up with, I was able to confidently replace my war-based slash deb file-based installation with one that runs from a Docker image on the same machine because I eventually got them synchronized well enough. So, so it's now, now if you say, oh, I don't need or want a, a test environment, then my technique may not help you. But if you're interested in it, I can paste into the chat a link to the thing that I use. So maybe my tooling would give you a little, a little pointer. Uh, what we do is exactly what you have uh, described. Uh, we uh, use rsync to copy the whole Jenkins home um, mm. a directory to a new uh, virtual machine and we start uh, a newer version of Jenkins and start the migration on this test machine and if it's go uh, uh, right then we uh, make the same thing uh, on the productive machine but you brought me to the idea we should not copy the whole <laughs> Jenkins home maybe we should uh, uh, make it a uh, 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 smaller pieces uh, copy, not well, everything, well, but but parts of it. At least, at least for me, it was a it was a it was a positive experience to incrementally start from wherever I was, right, with everything managed the way I was used to managing Jenkins, with everything done from the user interface, and I, I had I clicked through web pages to make every change. But then that rsync and copy those contents into a repository was a great help. It turned out very, very useful to me and it's made my development better. All right, it, 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 the, the embarrassing thing here is not just made my Jenkins installation better, but it's made my experience as a developer of Jenkins components better because I can now easily drop my test code into something that looks very, very much like my production environment. Yeah. So if you're interested in interested in the technique, the incremental move towards configuration as code, yeah. I'm going to put this into the uh, into the chat. See, and now this is this is truly evolutionary embarrassment publicly displayed all right and I, and i <laughs> if you if you look at the history of this particular repository you you will realize that mark wait hangs his head in shame 
at, at some <laughs> of the mistakes I've made in going through these evolutionary transitions, right? It's, oh, wow, well, that was foolish. Well, well, but that works. Oh, but that was bad. So, okay. so you're welcome to that. In my case, the concepts were of incremental improvement were so valuable that my mistakes just didn't matter, right? It, it, it turns out that incremental improvement made it so that the end result is better, even if I made a bunch of mistakes on the way. Yeah, we learn from our mistakes. Right. <laughs> yeah, cool, thank you very much. All right. It really will help us, or me. <laughs> well, and, and for me, it's, it's a reminder that the, the other thing that, that that experience of having a readily available um, thing that I can stand up that looks really close to production is that it lets me very rapidly get into interactive testing of some change I'm making. So we were just doing a Google Summer of Code project and that Google Summer of Code project made an important change to the Git client plugin and I needed to test it and it was minutes and I had that thing deployed into this environment that has thousands of jobs and has interesting configurations and is known to have, have problems in places that, that most people don't have. So, so for me it was, but, but that's, it's been an investment, right? I mean, doing incremental transition from old to new has taken time. Mm, yeah, sure. <sighs> All right, so look into it. Great. We, we've talked about, we've talked about um, development and transitions for plugins. Are there other things around plugin transitions? Let's see, Jonathan, for instance, on yours, you mentioned that you've you've had to upgrade, upgrade and find find your way through how to how to bring an old plugin to be current. And the adopt the plugins that are up for adoption commonly have that exact problem. They need to be updated, and you've got to explore. Okay, can I update it to depend on a modern Jenkins version, and what will that do to the code? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to use Marcel's idea and take a look at some of the plugins that my instant uses and see if some of those are in the up for adoption state. And, and, and I, I like that very, very much. That's that's a great way to to be able to had a had a good conversation the other day with someone who worried, hey, but I can't give 40 hours a week to this kind of thing. And I think that plug-in adoption is a place where you could give 30 minutes or an hour a week and do significant work. Realizing that if a plugin has been placed for adoption, right now that means there aren't people working on it. So any time you give to it is time that, that, that is net benefit. Now, if you if you'd like, we could we could look at Jenkins pipeline. Do you have do any of you have pipeline experience? Have you made the transition to pipeline, or is much of what you're doing related to freestyle? My I'm old fashioned. My stuff is all still freestyle. But okay, I have a little combination. Go ahead. I, I'm so, using pipeline, but also I'm using the. Uh, the library. So I'm provisioning, you know, common functions there through Groovy mostly. Okay, and then so I make uses of those from my pipeline. So okay, so you're you're what I would call even in a relatively advanced thing, you're using pipeline shared libraries so yeah. that you can have simple expressions of pipeline in most pipeline files that call something a little more complex in the library behind it. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, Excellent. I, yeah, since uh, we have everything on top of Kubernetes, we are using uh, configuration as code and all of that. So we, uh, at least that issue in which we have to replace, uh, upgrade or downgrade, not that we haven't needed to downgrade, but yeah, that's something that you should look at for sure, Valentin. Yeah, that's made easier life. <laughs> and, and now in your Kubernetes environment, are you managing things there with, with Helm files or with, 
with YAML directly? What, what's, your, what's been your preferred way of, or using the Jenkins operator? Which, what's been your preferred way of deploying all the way to Kubernetes? No, um, so I, I, when I started to implement this on Kubernetes, I thought that the Kubernetes, the Jenkins operator it was mature enough. So I went to the uh, health chart. Uh, really? At that time, it was it was hosted on the Kubernetes uh, repo, but now it is, as we know, on the uh, Jenkins IO help chart. And, yeah, and that made you... easier things as well because you know it is just a matter of changing a YAML file, a value, sorry, a value on the for the help chart, and then the whole thing roll over. Pretty easy. Yeah, and, help. It sounds uh, more uh, a better approach than just using raw YAML file. So now, in your in your roll forward and roll back experience, have you found that there were unexpected barriers or things that you could share with us to, to in, say, hey, it would be better if we did this or our experience would have been better had this been in place instead? So um, one of the things that I have been thinking is that I need to improve the way that I am rolling out new grades because I have found in the past that uh, I am just upgrading the LTE version, right? On the uh, health chart value. And then there is a dependency of that uh, on plugins, a specific versions. And then since I fail on read the migration process, uh, my grade fails. So yeah, I, I have been thinking of having like a test environment just to uh, see how the gray goes, and then if everything works fine, I could be moving that gray to production. And and I've I've heard a number of people who who use that kind of a staging technique that you're describing, who who evaluate something in staging. I think it, it aligns with the way Valentin was describing. They're doing their, theirs. Your Kubernetes technique doesn't doesn't use our sync. It's I assume going from code now. In your Kubernetes def or in your your image definition, one of the things that we learned, I guess it was six or nine months ago, was that many users are are making the suboptimal choice of declaring their plugin versions in the definition of their thing, but not installing the plugin versions. So when their when their their new Jenkins installation starts, they were downloading the plugins at startup time. Uh, and and that's both expensive and slow to slow to process and a risk to you because then if the Jenkins update site is down, your Jenkins is stopped waiting for it to upgrade. Do you know is are yours are you using a separate Docker image to define your Jenkins with plugins or you're defining no. the? Okay, so you've that, got that's another process uh, that I need to improve. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess that the recommended way, I, I think that I read it on the wiki or somewhere else that uh, I should build my own Docker image with the plugins that I need. Yeah, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, provisioning time, it will reduce the provisioning time. I found that that's a little uh, risky just to install on the fly, even though if you are not upgrading, if the pod just gets killed, you will be getting installed all those plugins again. Oh, 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 right. That's a, I, I had not even thought of that. The reality yeah. is on a pod restart, you get a reinstall. Of yeah. those of those plugin versions, and that that's that's expensive. You because during a pod restart, you want that thing back as quickly as you can. Yeah, well, although I should mention that uh, the star uh, 
the bootstrap process, he, I will say that it doesn't take more than five minutes, to be ah, honest. Okay. So but, it's... but yeah, the, uh, there are occasions in which uh, a plugin could fail on that because I don't know the uh, instead of uh, using a specific version that was long time ago, and a specific version I used the latest version of the plugin, mm -hmm. declare on the configuration as code, and then what happened is the uh, controller was restarted, and on the bootstrap process the plugin was installed with a different version because I have instead of a fixed version I have the latest. Right, uh, right. So now you got a you got an implicit upgrade, even though you you hadn't expected to get an upgrade at that moment. Yeah, yeah. So but now, yeah, having the Docker image with all the plugins that's for sure one of the things that I uh, want to do uh, for the reason that we have said. May, may, I, may, may I ask a question? Uh, so, uh, if you uh, have a new image with newest plugins, uh, for example, uh, six weeks past, and there is a new uh, Jenkins LTS version available, you you built a new image with newest plugins, and you want to bring it into your production or test uh, environment. Uh, you what what you uh, do is uh, you have a volume somewhere on, on the file system bind uh, to, to your uh, image. <laughs> and uh, there is a plugin information. There is older, for older versions of these plugins. Uh, are you deleting this directory or what, what, how, how you approach this uh, update um, scenario? So currently I am not doing anything in regard to the volume. Uh, usually, uh, I believe that mostly it is being taken care by Jenkins itself. But what I've uh, realized is that in some occasion when uh, you grade the Jenkins, you can get a warning like saying you have uh, an old uh, or legacy configuration related to those plugins. Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep it or delete it? That's why I believe um, Jenkins is taking care of those. So you don't need to clean up. I, I okay. guess that Mark, you have more information about that. But yeah, that's what I have seen. I have an experience. Okay. Any okay. issue related to the configuration. Yeah, there's a w one more problem with it. If you um, deleted a plugin from plugin TXT <laughs> mm -hmm. and build a new image, and you start uh, uh, Jenkins with this new image and uh, bound volume, you you still have the old plugin installed in, in your Jenkins environment, <laughs> right? And you can't cannot get get rid of it because it is in your file system that's bound in, in, to your image. <laughs> Well, and, and so that was why, from, at least from my usage, I've preferred to have the Jenkins, the, the base Docker image includes the plugins in the image, and it's not a separate volume, right? It's, it's absolutely just part of, because what, what I wanted was I want the ability to know that the thing I described, I could go back in time if I had to and build it again. Now, this, this for me is actually a relatively recent thing because I spent the longest time doing exactly what Marcel was doing of using latest. I, I, I always want the latest plugins. And so I want to stay with latest. It turns out that this, this new tool called the Plugin Installation Manager has some automation inside of it that will help me maintain the list of, I, okay, I was lazy. I didn't want to maintain the list of exact plug-in plug version numbers manually. I, that was just, I've got 150 plugins and tracking those version numbers was just unacceptable. I, I, I couldn't imagine tracking those numbers. But the plugin installation manager tool is this Java program that will generate the exact list of plugin name version pairs 
and write it to the file for me. And so what I've got is this ability to say, run one command that says, tell me the current version numbers, write it to a plugins.txt file as exact version numbers. And another command that says, now go download exactly those versions from, from the update center. So, so I was using the exact technique Marcel's described of latest for the longest time for years, and it worked just fine. But it meant just the way Marcel described it, sometimes I would get silent upgrades of my plugins and I, I hadn't thought about that and didn't know how to go back if, if I wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. so, so, but for me, the magic there was the plugin installation manager tool. And, and, and I found the set of arguments to pass to that thing to use it so that it would maintain the file for me because otherwise I would never have tolerated maintaining all those version numbers. I'd have never kept up to date. Yeah, it's almost impossible with 150 plugins. <laughs> but, and, and now there is a different technique and there's a different te technique that the Jenkins infrastructure team uses. The Jenkins infrastructure team uses a, a Dependabot configuration that will watch the Jenkins Update Center and propose pull requests to their plugins.txt file for new versions. And so they're still tracking exact version numbers, but if you're interested in that, I could, I could probably paste you a link to that one if you say, oh, I wanna use Dependabot to track these things. That, that, that was a, a, an interesting technique that the Infra team found. If I understand this correctly, uh, Dependabot works only with GitHub. That's that's correct. Yeah. So okay. if you're using if you're locally hosting or using yes. Gitty or using Bitbucket, then it, it won't help. Okay. Pity for us. <laughs> well, well, but <laughs> but that's where the the plugin installation manager tool will work for you. And maybe work you just can fine. post a link uh, about plugin installation tool. You bet. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Because so let me. Yeah, only tool I, I know is a Jenkins CLI jar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Marcel. What was that? Uh, I will be interested to see how the infra team is using the Pendabot for that. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Super. And so to be honest, I, I am struggling with what you just mentioned. I need to go over uh, every plugin version when I am grading. Uh, I think that uh, there was a major grade on the LTEs. Uh, version some months ago. So I went through all of those and also, especially because I graded from uh, JDK 8 to 11. That was another uh, milestone on that LTS, I believe. But yeah, I, I, I have to track all the individual version for plugins. Hmm. Okay, so so you're you're headed in that direction. Uh, you you see that coming. Yeah. Okay. Well, so so let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna paste a link to this thing that that I use to get available updates. And yes. So here we go. So in the chat session, whoops, where did I put it? Here is the Python code. Okay, so I, I'm a Python scripter. So Python script that calls uh, the plugin installation manager tool to maintain the precise plugins.txt file. So there's that one. And, and then the, let me get the Jenkins infra reference because I get those pull requests all the time, upgrading, upgrading LTS plugins. Upgrade LTS. Let's see, maybe it's called plugin upgrade. Jenkins, sorry, I'm having to look. Uh, 
have to look in trash. I may have thrown them away. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Maybe the word is update. English is too fluid. It allows too many synonyms. Nope. Okay. Update. Where is it? Okay, I will have to take a separate action item. I'm not finding it in my search and I know I get them all the time. Plug in update. Jenkins infra plug in update. I am so sorry, I'm not finding it. I know that I get this message all the time. And so I'll, I will, I will let me take an action item to gather that. And if you're willing to actually, let me paste my email address. If you're willing to send, send your email address to mark.earl.wait at gmail.com and I'll share the link to the Jenkins info repo There we go. And I am, I am feeling awkward now because I should be able to just find it. Let me look for it with a slightly different technique. It always happens when you're trying to do a demo live. <laughs> right. That's, that's the price I pay. So yeah. <laughs> I think it may have the word Docker in it. Ah, yes, there it is. Okay, good. I found it. Okay, so if we look at this one with Docker, yes, I found it. Oh, I'm so proud. Okay, good. <laughs> See the Jenkins Infra LTS upgrade process at this thing. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's take a look at it just so you can get a sense of how it operates. So here is the you should see the Docker Jenkins LTS repository now. Do you see that? I do. Okay. I do. And in the .github directory, here is, so in the .github directory, we have three workflows enabled. So Dependabot is here that runs GitHub Actions. And then in the workflows, we've got update.yaml, which does this operation. Let's see, so it generates the token and then it runs on the update plugins branch, this operation here. Oh gotcha. no, here it is. It's this one. It's this Jenkins Infra UC. This tool is a thing that looks at plugin lists and, gen and generates an update to them. And the result is written as one of these pull requests. So here it says chore dependencies, update plugins. And what happened is it's proposing a change from warnings ng 9.2.0 to 9.2.1. And from workflow CPS global live 2.20 to 2.21. And a human being didn't have to do it. It just did this on its own. This is gold for my eyes. Great, great. That's excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, and 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 for me, it was this is work that Gareth Evans did as part of Jenkins infrastructure. And it's been absolutely wonderful for us. It helps us maintain things better and keeps us up to date. Mark, one more question. 
uh, does it update uh, each plugin to the latest version or some particular version? So, so the the thing it's proposing yeah. is it proposes the most recent version, but it's it's a little more sophisticated than that because it's proposing the most recent version that is supported with that Jenkins version. Okay. So, for example, it is perfectly legal for a Jenkins plugin to declare that it requires as its minimum version version Jenkins two two hundred ninety nine. And when I try to install that from the latest LTS, which is 289, it will correctly say, no, you can't have that because it's too new. It mm -hmm. requires a much newer Jenkins version. And this tool will not offer that update because it's not supported with the Jenkins version that it's trying to match. Okay. Yeah, so very good question. Very, very good. So there's Intel behind. <laughs> there, there is, and and that same that same that same intelligence exists in that plugin installation manager tool that I was describing earlier, right? It it does the same thing. In order to help, in order for it to make a recommendation, you must tell it which Jenkins version you're targeting, and it will then use that information to to provide the list for you. Cool, cool, very cool. Yeah. So in, in your case, Valentin. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are not using GitHub, you should be able to look at the implementation yeah. uh, right. of the GitHub action that Mar shared. Yes. This is this is implemented in using Docker. Okay. Uh, it's a Go application actually. So you should be able to use this implementation on your site as well, regardless you are using GitHub or not. Okay. Okay. I will. I will be looking into it. Well, and, and and Marcel makes a very good point that most of these things are done exactly that way, right? Where where this this uh, let me share that screen again just to show because it's it's good to so if we look at this update plugins pull request and we go look at the repository in the .github workflows, there's this entry that says. Jenkins infra slash UC. Well, guess what? That, as as Marcel correctly noted, is just a Docker image. This right? is the image. And and if you say, oh well, what where is that coming from? Well, guess what? It comes from a repository in Jenkins Infra called UC. Yeah. This is what Marcel posted into the chat. Oh, oh, very good. Okay, great. Yes, so there it is. And and this, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Oh, yes, there it is. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Marcel. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's how I learn things. I, I <laughs> it's on occasion I look at the uh, GitHub Actions that people are using. Not that I'm using GitHub Actions. We use Jenkins, right? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, it's an occasion I learn how uh, people are doing certain things and if in different it's way. Not, uh, yeah, if it, it doesn't fit on my infrastructure, I just adapt it. Excellent. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Are, are there are there other topics that we would like to touch on, or other things that come to mind as a question? I think I I'd like to add something. So, yes. So, as a newcomer contributors, uh, some of uh, people would not know that uh, how to go and check out all the available Gitter channels that Jenkins has. So I think if I paste the link for Jenkins CI dot slash home uh, on the chat, so people can look at it uh, for obviously those who are present in the meeting right now. So they can look at it and join the, <laughs> the available cha Gitter channels that they like to. That's excellent. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so we get a screenshot of it. So what okay. this shows us is, or, or Diraj, maybe you can describe what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
So the, yeah. these are the Gitter chat channels, right, that are available to Jenkins users. So if you've got a question about configuration as code, there's the channel. If you've got a question about, let's see, what's a, oh, we've got lots more to go through. Let's look for the plugin installation manager tool. Yep, there it is. Or maybe you've got questions about the Jenkins Git plugin. Here's a group that focuses on that. And it looks like there are many, many, many chat channels all focused on different parts of using Jenkins. Thanks, Diraj. Good suggestion. Now, where'd my stop share go? Also, there we are. Also, I'd like to share one very small experience that I think might help someone who's uh, who, who's in the same position at me that has been new to contributing. So, when I was uh, learning about configuration as a code plugin, I was very uh, I still am very uh, interested in it because it works like a magic to me because <laughs> so it's really cool. So uh, I, I came across one technique that uh, in order to uh, configure the plugins using J, uh, Jcast plugin, uh, we need to know its YAML syntax, right? So uh, everyone does not know how to write the correct YAML syntax for config configuring a particular plugin. So what they can do is go to you know their own Jenkins instance and configure it and come back to the YAML file and then copy paste the code. So I know it will not make sense to uh, someone who's uh, new to this. The I'm trying to hear is that uh, one on Gitter channel to know that someone who uh, who is technique and I assume that uh, people would uh, know this uh, very easily. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, there's always something that you can contribute from your end. And uh, if it's not going to help everyone, it's going to help someone for sure. So you need to volunteer and uh, bring the idea to the Gitter channel. And uh, we can discuss more on that and uh, we can put it and publish it if uh, it helps anyone. So welcome for the contribution from that area as well. Excellent. Well, and Diraj, Diraj, you did a great blog post actually, and a video on that configuration as code experience, right? And that that blog post and that video were were good highlights. That hey, the experience can be much simpler, much easier if you use these techniques. Exactly, and I will uh, boast myself by saying it has more than uh, four hundred views now. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. That's great. So your video, your video is being seen. That's very good. Excellent. Yes. It feels good to know that people are finding it helpful. Now, I believe several of you had noted that you're, you're on the way to pipeline. You've got a mix of freestyle jobs and pipeline jobs. If you're okay with it, I'd be happy to do a brief demo on some things that I think you ought to be aware of as pipeline capabilities so that you, you don't miss these capabilities as, you, as you're considering, should I try pipeline? Would, would you be okay watching a little demo, watching, letting me go through and talk about pipeline a little bit and trying to sort of introduce the concepts and then show some demonstration of what, what you can do with pipeline and what many people may miss as capabilities that are available in pipeline that they, they didn't realize were there. Yeah. That'd be okay, good. cool. So, so Marcel, uh, any question from you or concern there? Yeah, I have to go now. Sorry that, uh, no yeah, problem. I another meeting, but uh, I would like to ask, uh, so I believe someone mentioned you're going to be a demo on this pipeline graph view plugin. Later today? Yes, I, th I think that's later today during the, I believe the pipeline graph view plugin will be shown during the, the oh dear, what's the title? During the Closing Ignite session? Talks and Demos. Okay. okay. That's uh, an entry on the, agent, on the agenda, right? It is. Although if you, if you would just like, yes, it is an entry on the agenda. It's scheduled to start in 
about, let's see, we're at 1030 now. So it's eight, nine, 10, 1030. So it's scheduled to start in about 90 minutes. But Marcel, I can also paste a link to you for you of an existing demonstration of pipeline graph view that we had a video of. That way you could you could even look at the video separately if, if for some reason you couldn't come back to attend the Ignite demo. Okay, yeah. Let me see if I can find that really quickly here because that that should be pretty easy for me to find as a video. I posted it to colleagues at inside my company some year, some time ago. So pipeline graph view. Is, am I, Diraj, am I getting the name right? Is it, it is pipeline graph view plugin, right? Yes, there Pipe, we go. Pipeline graph view, yep. Right, okay, and now, where is the, the video of it? Pipeline graph view for pipeline is. Okay, so I've got to look for it a slightly different way. YouTube.com, Jenkins playlist, because what it was was we had the, the author of the plugin presented it in a brief demonstration in a presented it in a brief demonstration. I'm getting feedback. Is anybody else getting feedback? Yeah. Okay. I All right, so we'll, we'll continue. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't mean to be echoing. Okay, so let me see if I can find that just really quickly because it should be in the playlist. Yeah, we, we, are, uh, we are using it. I intended Ooh. to ask questions oh, about good. Okay. some right. limitation. Yeah, some limitation. Okay. We just uh, implemented a new pipeline and we, find, we found that the parallel uh, execution of several states, they don't show properly, even though on their, the classic view, it is presented properly. Okay, so so you so maybe this you, is a limitation or something. So I intended to ask. Perfect. If you're already a user of it, then this yeah. video I was going to link you to is no help. So about ninety minutes from now, join the ignite session, and we will we will look for the demo there, and you can ask your question there. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marcel. Thanks very much yeah. for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. So I was going to go ahead and and show some things relative to pipeline. Uh, let's let's first give a brief, I guess a, a simplest way to say it is a brief look at some of the concepts around pipeline. And let me see if I can find my slide deck to share. Not that one, I want. Too many tabs. Ah, yes, here we go. Okay, so this was, a, this was just a, a very beginning kind of thing. So, so the idea here is that Jenkins, whoops, copy the link in case you want the slides. There's a copy of them. The, these are no way polished enough to be to be claimed to be perfect, but they're they're a beginning. So you're familiar oh, present with pipeline with freestyle jobs. We configure them for the web browser. It's really easy to do. We store them inside Jenkins, makes them easy to change, but it's not nearly as easy to see what's changed or why it was changed. And we don't get a lot of help from people. They just made a change and they went on. And it's strongly dependent on plugins. And if a job starts, if, if Jenkins stops, the freestyle job stops as well. There's no way of continuing it to run across a Jenkins restart. Jenkins pipeline jobs are configured from a source repo. So you configure them as code. They're right inside your source repo. So the job definition is not embedded in Jenkins. Storing it in your source repo makes it easier to maintain. 
easier to see what's changed and gives you Git comments from the people who made the changes. So it's using a pattern you're accustomed to. And it puts the burden of the work predominantly in your build scripts instead of requiring that you find a wide set of Jenkins plugins. So they're also able to continue running across a Jenkins restart. They're able to run in parallel. They're able to run on multiple agents and they're able to run with multiple software configuration management systems in various interesting combinations. Very, very flexible and very capable. So there are two domain specific languages that are implemented in pipeline. One is declarative and the other is scripted. Uh, declarative is a very, uh, is the second generation of pipeline language, if you will. It's intentionally simplified, intentionally designed to be managed and read and implemented by people who may not be precise programmers. Scripted looks an awful lot like Groovy code. It's a DSL that's derived from Groovy. It is more difficult to read, but it's got a, a, a larger feature set. And now for me, the cool thing about this is that these domain specific languages are dynamic. The keywords that are used in the languages, the steps or the tasks are defined by the set of plugins that you have installed. And that means the pipeline snippet generator and the directive generator can let you use exactly what's in your system. Now it's time to stop the, stop the slides and let's get to a real demo because, because this is where I think it, it matters the most. So let's look at my Jenkins installation. Whoops, wrong one. My Jenkins installation here. Okay, this is a real Jenkins installation. It's Jenkins 2.289 pre-release. It's got 30 or 40 uh, agents connected to it. Some of them are dynamic from the cloud. Others are here and there and everywhere. So a real, a real Jenkins. When I want to define a new plug, a new job, and I want to put pipeline into that repository, I just click open blue ocean and click new pipeline. And now it asks me which, where do I keep my code? And okay, Bitbucket, Bitbucket server, GitHub Enterprise, GitHub, or just vanilla Git. And in my case, let's see, do you have a preference? I think I've got accounts on most of these. I don't have a GitHub Enterprise account, but the others we could, you want to use Git? Would you like to use GitHub? So Valentin, let me ask you, which, which repository management system are you using? I'm using Bitbucket. Okay, good. So let's use, let's use Bitbucket Cloud. Okay, now I've got to get some, a username and password. So for this, I'm going to go to Bitbucket Cloud. Let's see. And so get Bitbucket. And I may have to turn off screen sharing briefly if it prompts me to enter a password. Let's try continue with, oh yeah, let's try this just to see if, it, if it's connected to my Atlassian account. That way I didn't, okay, now I have to insert my security token. Oh, I'm so proud of these things because I've got two-factor auth. <laughs> yes, okay, good, here we go. All right, so now let's look at various repositories. So here's a repository. Now this one already has a Jenkins file in it. So it's already defined. We can just use that one and let's try that. Or if we would like, I could create a new repository that doesn't have, let's see, maybe we should, well, let's, let's take that one. So I need to get a username and for this, I need to copy my password. Okay, now I'm going to temporarily suspend sharing in case it were to publish this password visibly. So just a minute, stop share. Okay, and I think I'm mark.earl.wait. Okay, and it did not show my password in plain text, so I can start sharing again. We've got a new visitor, Abhishek. Thanks, Abhishek, for joining us. 
Uh, so now I'm gonna share my screen again and let's look at, okay, so here, let's try this connect. We'll see if I got the right password, et cetera. Connect. Hmm, I'm not seeing what I wanted there. I wonder if maybe I gave it a bad password. Let's check my account here because it may be, Valentin, do you remember, does Bitbucket require that I use something other than my email address? Maybe I should check my profile, huh? I'm not sure. I think username and password is the thing that you need. Yeah, so, okay, so let's see what I've got as my username. We're going to try a different username. And if this doesn't work, we'll try, we'll switch to use GitHub. Okay, so there it says invalid username or password. At least a feedback. Yes, exactly. So we're going to switch. I'm going to use GitHub for this one just for it's the moment. Okay. Yeah. This one, I know it already has my credentials in it. So here, if, if I use GitHub and say, Marky, wait. Now it lets me choose one of the repositories. And so, for instance, I could choose the repository named bin, or I could choose some other one. Let's see, how about... Let's go looking, let's, let's take bin for now, bin and create pipeline. And it's gonna tell me on this one, oh, I've already got a pipeline, I'm going to start using it. But then we're going to use this exact same set of tools to edit that pipeline and make some changes to it. So it found not just my master branch, but also two other branches and ran work on those two other branches. And here, one of them's already finished, the other one's finished, and there we see it. This is all just part of Blue Ocean. It, and Pipeline Graph View, the one that Marcel was referencing, gives a similar view to this with a much lighter weight, uh, still very, very new um, environment. So here we've got this. Notice in the top right-hand corner, there's this little pencil icon. So I can click that pencil icon and it puts me into an editor that lets me edit my pipeline. So here is the build step that I defined and it has a message that says building and I'm going to say building the master branch because I'm on the master branch, I'm gonna save and now I'm gonna go back here. In the test, it says, print the message testing, I'm gonna say the master branch. And it adds a warning badge. And then I've got a deploy step where it says, oh, let's save the artifacts. All that I can do from this Jenkins Blue Ocean interface. It's that simple. If I said, oh, I want to go parallel. Okay, I need a second test. And here we are going to add a step that is print the message second test step in parallel. So there's test and maybe we should rename this one instead of test. Let's call it first test. All of this directly from the Blue Ocean interface. So I am, I am, here I am defining my build pipeline in a graphical experience that lets me just add things where I need to, make comments, etc. Now I'm gonna save it. And in this case, add a parallel test, change the, um, change the messages. And I could commit it to a new branch or I could submit it right to master. Um, either is fine. Do you have a preference? Wh which would you like, master branch or a new branch? 
master branch. Okay, a master branch it is. We're going to save it and run it. So now what we will see now is that if I look at the master branch, you look, there's a, a run number one. And now as I go, oh, there it is. Build number two has started. If I look at number one, you see it's a linear flow, build, test, deploy. Now, if I go back to bin two, there's my build, first test, second test and deploy. Now, ultimately, most users may not even actually look at these views, right? They may say, look, all I wanna know is that the thing finished and published a result somewhere. I don't care about the pretty view, but for me, I find it helpful to do my initial layout of what steps should be in my pipeline from this user interface so that I don't have to have to worry about exact placement of braces, exact where does everything go. This gives me now, and if we look at my repository here, we'll see this as code. So let's look at on my GitHub account, we're going to look at the bin repository. So let's grab one of these and we'll just rewrite it. And here are my commits, add a parallel test, change the messages. And there it did all this changing for me without requiring that I go into a text editor and do it. So it feels as smooth and easy as a Jenkins freestyle job. And yet it's represented as code inside my repository. Cool. Uh, now, I have a question. Uh, yes, just, go ahead. Uh, the question is, is it possible to run this uh, configuration without pushing your, uh, your changes to the Git? server? Oh, that's a very good question. And the answer is yes. Cool. Um, it's okay. So now that's, I would call that almost an advanced topic, but I'm going to go ahead and show it to you if that's okay. So let's you, you say, well, what if I, what if I want to just experiment with something and not, not commit to the repository? Here's this replay facility that shows me, Hey, here's step number two. And I realized I shouldn't call it master branch because when I'm on a pull request, it, mm -hmm. it won't be correct. So building, testing, second test, let's see, first test. Yeah. So, and then deploying. Yeah, there we go. So, so I have changed it. I'm going to say run. Now what we'll see is it's going to do the checkout. It'll, okay, these, I have to admit, the steps are all very, very fast, right? Because yeah. all they are is saying messages. And, but now if I go open Blue Ocean and look at that thing, let's look at the message here, building. It didn't say building. So, so my change was there and yet I never deployed it to the repository. So this replay button, Mm -hmm. gives me the ability to do dynamic tweaks to do rapid explorations. Okay. But uh, you make these tweaks in a text editor and not in the Blue Ocean interface anymore. Oh, well, I, That's good, correct. I think so. And I've never tried to do a replay in Blue Ocean, but I don't think I can. Okay, so okay. Let, me, let me double check that because if I go back here, let's look at number two. And there is a see this rerun button, but mm -hmm. when I click the rerun here in the top right-hand corner, my recollection is all that does is rerun the, the job exactly as it was defined. Mm -hmm. So I'll look at three and here's three. And if we, and now guess what? Four will be available very soon. And there is four and four uses, uses two. All right, so I reran four. And it uh, reran two, and it did it did it as a new job, a new version, a new number four. Okay. So yeah, there isn't a way in Blue Ocean to do that interactive rework and not save to the repository. Okay, cool. It's new for me. Now, now there's another there's another really what I think of as okay. This is so you remember we were here in replay. See this link at the bottom, this thing called pipeline syntax? That is magical. 
I'm going to click that and we're going to look to see just how magical that is. So, so in the pipeline syntax link, it opens up a snippet generator where I decide which step I want to try. Oh, I need to run a Windows batch command. And I would like that to say echo hello world. And then I want it because it's Windows, I want it to say dir slash od. And by advanced settings, I would like the output to come back as UTF-8. And I want to know the return value of this thing. So I want the exit status, oops, UTF-8. And I want the return status. So I just, with the user interface, described what I want to do, right? Interactive clicking to describe what I want to do. I click this generate pipeline script and there it is. Now I can copy this. I can go back over here to replay. And now, now I have to do some additional things because I gotta be sure that I run on Windows. And now I'm going to insert in there that thing that I just did. So I have just taken code that it generated for me, pasted it into my script, and now I'm going to run it. And now let's watch it to see what happens. Let's see if I'm any good at writing Windows batch commands. So special thanks to my daughter who donated her computer to let me use it as an agent after it got old. Mm -hmm. Now you can tell that it's old because Nate, notice how long it's taking to clone this, this relatively small 60 megabyte repository. <laughs> but this pipeline syntax generator lets me choose what I want to do and then it will generate the code for me. And now that, that one that I just did was actually relatively simple, right? Oh, okay, it's not hard to write a batch file when you're doing a checkout and using all of the options of the Git plugin, it's really painful if you don't use the snippet generator. So we're definitely going to use it for this one. Let's, oh, we'll, we'll go after a public repository. We don't actually need to authenticate. So now there, there, there may be additional settings that I want to add, like, oh, I need the advanced clone behavior to not fetch tags and to honor the initial ref spec. And I want to time out in three minutes if it doesn't finish on time. And I need to use a checkout to a specific local branch. I'm going to name that branch master. All sorts of things like that. And I could keep adding those. And guess what? When I generate the pipeline script, there is all the magic that I needed to do that job. So now if we go back here, we should see, ah, notice, here's that, you remember I gave it echo hello world and dir slash od, there it is. So, so pipeline snippet generator is a great way to make your life simpler. It just is. The same thing exists for declarative directives as well. This one where we say, I need to in declarative decide, I only want to run on specifically labeled agents like one with the label windows. Generate that and there it is. And now I could have pasted this into that same, same replay. Any questions so far? All right. So you have, you have been very tolerant of almost three hours of this. Thank you very, very much. I would like to be able to attend the next session. And I believe it's scheduled to start in about five minutes because I want to talk about Java 11 with others. Any questions you've got in the last five minutes before we end? Uh, hello, Mark. This is Sudesh over here once again. Uh, yes, in Sudesh. The pipeline, hi. In, this, in, this, in the pipeline script, uh, can you please help me know if 
there is a requirement for a restart how can i implement that so restart from a particular stage so you want to do a programmatic restart from stage yes that's right so let's consider you have a build stage and a test test stage right mm -hmm. so in the build stage like if let's consider that the build stage is successful and the test test there is some failure in the test test phase so how can i ensure that in my next run i don't build it once again but i resume from the test so i, I that's a good question unfortunately i'm not sure sudeth that i know the answer because i'm used to using restart from stage at this level and then and then now if i remember correctly we may have to ask darren pope or some other friends with more pipeline experience i suspect what you need to do is in preceding stages you need to stash the results of that stage so that you can unstash it stash or archive the res results of that stage so that you can unstash it in the later stage so so let's let's try that shall we should we do a, a little experiment hmm. sure sure thanks mark yeah so I'm going to do a run, build a run of oh, whoops. There we go. So with this number six, it's saying we restart from stage, and it's still doing the git fetch. So I'm not sure how to how to guarantee you that the restart from stage does not perform the work. Oh, oh, here it is. Actually, there we see it. Okay, it's showing it it skipped the build stage and assumed it could run right into test. So restart from stage did do what we expect here. Let's look at it in blue ocean to see. Yes, okay, good. So it did do the skip. So the, the, the crucial thing for you, Sadesh, then is that what that means is you must assure that the build stage has archived its results either through a repository archive like to a, to an artifactory or a nexus or through a stash if the results are relatively small and then that you in the test phase unstash and that's important also because it's possible for a build stage to run on one agent and this parallel test thing to run on two different agents and if you have a dependency on on, on the build results in the test, which most of us do, you want to have saved it in the build and then unstashed it or restored it in the test. So here, let's, let's try that and let's use our, our, our techniques here. So we're going to add a step, which is a stash. Let's see, and is it called stash? Yes stash some files to be used later in the build. And the file we're gonna stash is readme.md. Although that one's already, no, what we need, we need to do something that's visibly not there. So how about we would, in this, we're going to create a file and we're going to do that with a shell script scp readme.md to readme-new.md. Okay. And git clean, before we do that, we're going to do a git clean minus xffd so we get rid of anything that might have already been there. So this file is the one we're going to stash. So we add a step to stash and we're going to stash that file now in the test stage we need to do an unstash oops maybe they call it restore yes restore files previously stashed and we need to do that in second test phase as well And I, I apologize, Sudesh, we're going to run out of time. I've, I'm going to have to, but let's, let's just do this for fun. I think we should be able to see it and let's watch it. So just to assure that this, 
There we go. So we've got a stash, an unstash, and or a restore and a restore. So save that. Stash a file in build, unstash in test. Okay, and this will very shortly launch. So there's six branches. Oh yes, master is building. So there it restored the file. And here it restored the file. So did that address your questions, Sudesh? Yes, thanks, Mark. That was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for being part of the Jenkins Contributor Summit today. I'm going to drop off and this the session recording will make sure it gets uploaded so that it's available. Thank you very much. This was... yeah, thank Thanks. you very much, thank you. everyone. Thank you for joining Diraj. Thank you and have a good night's sleep. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Aditya, likewise, it's midnight your time or worse, you're both heroic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bro. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.